This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. If you want to open your Bibles, St. John chapter 11, and uh, beginning with verse 11 down through verse 16, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Almost in this day and time, People don't even know what it is to open a Bible. Now they, they search and put the scripture in and the digital world. But I don't know about you. I mean, I, I'm, I'm fully computer literate, but I'm going to tell you the truth. I can find the scripture better in my Bible, in my hard copy Bible, than I can in the digital. I'd love for them to just race me. <laughs> St. John chapter 11, verse 11. Notice here the word of the Lord. After these sayings, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. And the disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sakes, I'm glad that I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go that we may die with him. I want to talk about responding to God's sound. Responding to God's sound. God has a sound in the earth. That sound we call his voice. But it is the sound of God. It's the sound of God. Jesus went to Bethany uh, to awaken his friend Lazarus. He went there for an awakening. And let me just say this to you that in America, particularly today, the church is not dead, but the church is asleep. And we need the voice of God, the sound of God to once again stir the church and awaken us to our divine God-given purpose in the earth. Now, uh, you'll notice here that Jesus refers to Lazarus as being asleep and not dead because the term sleep, when you really understand sleep, it, it actually means able to be recovered. Death is an irretrievable process. But when a person is asleep, they are able to be recovered. We lay down at night and go to sleep, and sleep is a death-like state. And that's why people, when they wake up in the morning, they thank the Lord. Yeah. You know, that his mercies were made new another day. They found out that they were still breathing. You know, the old folks used to have some, a lot of old kind of sayings. Like they would say, Lord, I thank you that last night that my sheets were not my winding cloth and that my bed was not my cooling slab. I mean, it's like they were talking. I mean, it, you know, young people now need some interpretation to say, what in, what in the earth are they talking about cooling slab and winding sheets, winding cloth? But they, they were thankful when they would wake up the next day that God had, had spared death because they had lost consciousness all while they were asleep. And, but death, sleep really means able to be recovered. And that's why Jesus said he's asleep because Jesus knew that Lazarus could be recovered. When you are dead, that's an irretrievable process. But Jesus knew he's asleep, so I can bring him back. I can bring him back. So thank God we're not dead. We're really just asleep because we are able to be recovered. Um, when we actually say that somebody uh, awakens us, uh, it's really a voice, some kind of a voice that awakens us. Now, there are different kinds of voices. There's a voice of your alarm clock, and that can awaken a person. Uh, some people have their, their clocks set to music so that they are not 
you know, just startled by, eh, eh, eh. they just want music. And so there's a voice of music. Uh, there are different kinds of voices. There's a voice of somebody that lives with you who feels obligated to help you get up in the morning. They feel like it is their sacred duty to awaken you, to let you know it's time to go to work, it's time to go to school, it's their, their voice. You know, my mother used to just come through the house, get up from there, get up from there. And it's, it's some people take it as a sacred calling to be able to awaken people and some of them get a sadistic kind of a joy out of awakening people who are delirious and wondering where am I and what day is it. But uh, there is also the voice of traffic. You can be awakened to horns and traffic going and the voice of children outside. There is the, the voice of our own body's circadian clock that awakens us. So we are generally awakened by a sound. If there is a loud sound, that sound can awaken you. Sound awakens us. But Jesus awakened Lazarus with his voice. Jesus awakened Lazarus with his voice. And that same voice that awakened Lazarus can also awaken us. It is the voice of the Lord. The voice of God or the sound of God is one of the most amazing things that we desperately need. If you notice St. John chapter 11 verse 43, when he had said these things, speaking of Jesus, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. King James Version said, come forth. But he was telling him, he was in a tomb, so he was really summoning him, come out of there. With a loud voice, he said, come out. Jesus called him out. And even in the slumber of death, he heard the voice. Isn't it amazing that God's voice is so awesome that he can speak and living man will lay down and die. And dead men, when God speaks, can rise up and live. That's why there's a power in just having the word of God. But God's voice has a distinctive sound. It really does. And, and my question to you is, do you recognize God's sound when you hear it? Do you recognize God's sound when you hear it? There's a sound of God. There is a sound of God. You might remember in Genesis uh, chapter 3, verse 8, it says, and they, speaking of Adam and Eve, heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now notice, when they heard God, they heard him walking, the sound of God, the sound of God. They heard the sound of God walking, not the sound of God talking. They heard his sound. God has a sound. He, he can be identified by a sound. You know, when you understand the character of a person, uh, there are some things that you would say, you know, that doesn't sound like so-and-so. Because when you know a person's character, you know the kinds of things that they would say and the kinds of things that they would not say. So you, you know, you recognize their sound. And you know, there, there are people in your life that, that have this bigger than life kind of personality. And you know, when somebody says something that that person used to say all the time, immediately, that's, that, that sounds just like Big Mama. That's, that sound, that's just like, and, and you know it sounds just like them because it reminds you of their character. So you see, God also has a sound. We have to learn how to recognize the sound so we can respond to that sound. Lazarus heard the sound of Jesus' voice and he responded to it. He didn't just lay there. There are people now, you know, this generation now, they'll just lay there like they don't even hear you. But to hear, to hear, whenever you find the word hear in scripture, it means to obey. It means to obey. So it, to hear God means to respond. If you ever read in the, in the Bible, the word hear, you can substitute obey. Uh, because it, it means that there's a response that is coming. Well, he said, if my people, which are called by my name, would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear, I will answer. I will answer, I will respond from heaven. He's not just saying that I'm going to, I'll listen to you. Listening is passive, hearing is active. 
So when the Bible says, hear the word of the Lord, he's saying, obey it. He's saying, uh, whenever you hear God, it demands a response. It means respond, respond. You cannot hear God without responding. That's why when you hear the sound of God thundering, it, it shakes something in you. You can not only hear him, you feel him. Because, you know, we hear through the vibration of sound waves. And God sends out these waves and we actually feel him talking to us. And the, the proof of the pudding that we have heard him is that we obey him. That we move when God is talking to, to us. Otherwise, God must say, you know what, you, he, they, they didn't hear me. Because if you hear God, it means that you obey him, that you answer, that you respond to him. There's a response. So are you listening for the sound of the Lord in the cool of the day? Are you listening for, for the sound of the Lord in the cool of the day? And it's interesting that this expression where it talks about the cool of the day, uh, it, it, it comes from a Hebrew word, uh, ruach, that actually means wind. Wind. They actually heard, see, they didn't hear his voice. They heard a wind of God walking. They heard a wind of God. And actually, an alternative uh, use of, of the, this comparative information in that phrase, the theologian said that it actually should be translated as the wind of the storm. Now, if, let's just take it with that. They heard the wind of the storm of God walking in the cool of the day, and they went and hid themselves because they were afraid. See, they knew they had messed up. And now they hear the wind of God of a storm. You know, I mean, they heard God. You, you know when you've messed up, you've done something wrong. And they heard a wind. This was not uh, a, a just a, a gentle, but this, there's indication there to say that this was the wind of a storm. They knew that God was coming in anger and judgment. That you have sinned against me. I gave you some simple rules. I said, you know what? You can eat of any tree in, in this garden, but the tree in the midst of God, don't eat of that. I, I, he's, I didn't give you a whole lot of instruction. I gave you just one tree not to, to partake of. And when they broke that, and here comes the wind of God. God knows what they've done. They are hearing the wish. They, they knew God was coming. Adam and Eve hightailed it out of there and went and hid. <laughs> As though you can hide from God. See, they, they recognize his sound. Oh, you can tell by the sound when mama is hot. And when daddy has lost his mind. You, you know, some, some of y'all had some crazy daddies. And, and you know when you hear that sound, you, you, got, to, you got to start running and hide. You, you just take off when he, when he come home. You, you, if you know that he's in a certain mood, you know that sound. And then they walk in, and, what, what, what's going on in here? The moment they walk in, you hear that sound, and immediately it, 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 it'll, it produces a response in us. It moves. And so this is, this is where they were, but they, they actually heard the sound of God walking. And they knew that this was God coming in judgment. That's why they were afraid. And they went and they hid themselves in response to the sound. God didn't even open his mouth. He hadn't said anything. And they knew what they had done. And they knew when God was coming, they knew God was not coming for a polite conversation. They knew God was coming to judge because God gave them simple instruction. Said, so, look, you got all of this. Isn't that crazy? That, you know, he's, he said, I've given you everything in here to enjoy. Just don't mess with this. And guess which one they wanted? <laughs> That's the only one they wanted. That's the only one that they wanted. And so that was a terrifying experience for them. But you see, God is speaking, but many are failing to recognize his sound. God is speaking, but many are failing to recognize his sound. We're just failing. And uh, the church is asleep. The church is asleep. How do I know the church is asleep? Because of stuff that has happened in our society. And the church hasn't done a blessed thing about it. Too much has happened in our world while we slept. How do I know that? Look at Matthew chapter 13, verse 24 through 26 in the English Standard Version. Verse 24, he put another parable for, before them saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. 
But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. Notice when that happened. He says, while men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds. See, an enemy hath done this while we were not away, uh, aware. I mean, they, they came in under the radar. They, they changed things so slowly and so subtly that it didn't alarm us. See, if something happens suddenly, we say, no, wait, wait, just wait just a minute. But when you change something gradually, people won't even fight it. They won't even fight it. You know, you can cook a frog in a boiler if you turn the, the heat up one or two degrees at a time. See, if you put it on high immediately, oh, he jumps, he'll hop right out. But if you warm him up little by little, it'll be frog stew. <laughs> and he won't even know it because the temperature is turning up so gradually while men slept, while men were unaware, unaware. They, they were not cognizant of what was going on in the world. They were not cognizant that family was being redefined. They were not cognizant that abortion was going out, out, of, out of the way. You see, uh, just think of some of the weeds that have demoralized the values that we, that we hold dear in, into Scripture. Just, just think about that, the weeds that have demoralized our society. Because, you know, we live in a society now that says, if it feels good, do it. That's not what God says. It, it is the Epicurean that says, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. The world says, enjoy yourself. But Jesus said, take up your cross and deny yourself. Follow me. So there's a total different philosophy. But the world now says, you know what? If it feels good, do it. You know what the world says? The world says, well, as long as it doesn't hurt anybody, uh, it's okay. No, no, no. What does God say? Did, did God say? Is that biblical? If we are Christians and if we have beliefs, where did the belief come from? Where is it substantiated in Scripture? You know, uh, we, we have the, you, you hear this saying now that uh, a person should have the right to love whomever they want to love. You know, Scripture uh, has a, a little a bit of variance with that. You know, they had some such strange relationships in the church at Galatia. The Apostle Paul wrote to them and he said, he said, y'all some real freaks. <laughs> the Apostle Paul said, he said, y'all got some stuff happening in y'all's church, in these churches in Galatia. He said that Gentiles don't even do. He said, y'all doing some freaky stuff. He says that a man would sleep with his father's wife. I mean, he said, y'all, I mean, they, they were strange relationships. And these were church folks. And it's, it's interesting, Galatia, the church at Galatia, had more, were operating in more spiritual gifts. And yet they had more carnal sin in them than you could shake a stick at. It, it was, I mean, it, it's, it's in the book. It's in the book. And so we've just, we've had these, tears, these weeds sown in our, in our morality and in the moral fiber, the foundation of our life. I mean, you know, the, the question comes down, who said that you need to be married in order to have sex? Well, well God said it. <laughs> and, and then, you know, then I've, I've heard this, that Christianity is just a religion that imposes guilt on people. You know, I mean, in whose opinion? And, and may I just remind you that when God gives commandments, they are commandments and not suggestions. The commandments of God are not mere opinions. They are the commandments of God. So you wonder, how did we get in the condition that we're in while men slept? An enemy had sown these kinds of weeds, and now we see them growing up in our world now. See, everything in the economy of God begins and ends with a call. Everything in the economy of God begins and ends with a call. Isn't that interesting? Have you ever noticed that, that when God calls us to do something, 
He calls us out of darkness into his marvelous light. You can't even come to the Lord unless you get a call. He has to call you out of sin. He calls us out of sin. Have you ever thought about this? That a career is what you are paid for, but a calling is what you are made for. These are different dynamics here. When you are, are in it, you know, a career is what you're paid for, but a calling is what you're made for. You're, you're made for this thing when, when you're, you're called to do something. If God calls you to do something, you were born for it. You were gifted for it. You were equipped for it. He gave you the right temperament to be able to handle it. You, you, you were born for it. You were born for it. You were born for it. So that's the way that things work with God. And did you realize that God calls us? He calls us to serve him. There's a calling to serve God. There is a calling to serve God. And uh, some people are not aware of that, that they've been called. They think that only preachers are called. No, 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 no. It's not just preachers who are called. Do you know a vocation, the word vocation? It comes from the word vocare, which literally means to call. Vacation, a vocation literally means the state of being called. Your vocation is supposed to be a calling. That's why you don't just pick a career based on what offers you the biggest salary. What you can uh, have the greatest, most comfortable kind of lifestyle. No, no, no. It ought to be a vocation, a calling. You ought to be called to teach children. You ought to be called you know, to, 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 to open a business. You have to be called to work in government. It's, that's, that's a calling for these things. You're not just called to preach. I want you to notice 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9 in the English Standard Version. Notice, the Lord who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. I want you to notice that again. Notice that, who saved us and called us. It's not saved or called he saved us and called us to a holy calling notice that he didn't call us to carnality he saved us and called us to a holy calling not because of our works he didn't call you based on anything that you've done but he called us because of his own purpose and grace for his own life which he gave us in Jesus Christ before the world ever began you are saved and called you're saved and called lay your hands on yourself say I'm saved and called, saved and called. say it again I'm saved and called, saved and called. say it once again I am saved and called you have to remind yourself, you're not only saved, you are saved for purpose. Salvation is not the culmination of anything. Salvation is the beginning of God's purpose being lived out and fulfilled in and through your life. He saved you for purpose. He saved you on purpose, with purpose, and for purpose. God saved you and called you with a holy calling. Not according to your works, but according to the purpose and the grace that was in Christ Jesus before the world began. So you are saved and called, saved and called. We're not just saved and called to preach. You're saved and called to sing. You're saved and called to dance. You're saved and called to write. Now, pe pe people's calling is different. The calling is different. Some people are saved and called to be a scientist, to be a doctor, uh, to start businesses, to teach. Uh, to mentor other people, sometimes to serve the poor. It, you're saved and called to build houses or to design or to be able to create programming or to work in customer service. You're saved and called. You're graced for it. You're graced for it. Saved and called. Calling is not just in a pulpit. It's not just what you do in a church. You're called to serve in the world. Have you ever thought about the fact that Joseph never called of God, anointed of God, had the wisdom of God, and all of his life served in civil government? But he was an instrument in the hand of God. Never did he put, preach behind a pulpit. Never did his ministry gift operate in the church. He operated in secular government all of the days of his life and he was second in command to Pharaoh, to the king or the president of the country himself. And God put him there to serve in government for his people. So there are callings 
uh, that, that are in the secular world. Secular does not mean it's of the devil. Secular means that it's done outside of the church. The sacred things happen in the church. The secular, secular means outside of the church. So if there are callings that are secular callings, but you're called nonetheless. Don't ever think that a person who's in business, anybody in business in here? You work in the business world? Listen, you can be called to the business world. Do you realize that the word businessman in Hebrew literally means man of faith? In the Hebrew, businessman means man of faith. It's a person of faith. You know why? Because business is a risk and it takes faith to go into business. If you're going to sell anything, a good or a service, you, it takes faith to do it. You have to be called to it. You can be called and anointed to do that. Called and anointed. So callings are not just things that are done in the church. That's calling to the world. In fact, we are the ecclesia, the called out ones, called out to the world. Jesus said, go ye into all the, the world, not into all of the churches. He says, go into all of the world and preach the, the gospel. So the call is to go out. It's to go out. We come into the church for empowerment, for teaching, for equipping, to go out and do the work of the ministry in the real world where the rubber meets the road. And that's a part of the call. And do you know that once you have served faithfully in your vocation, the last call that you get is a call to come home. He calls us home. And whether you realize it or not, each time uh, you can hear the voice or the sound of God, I believe that you heard it. You know how I know that you heard it? Because you're here. You're here. You're here. And please understand that hearing from God is not optional. It is necessary for the successful maneuvering of the Christian through life. It's not optional. It's necessary, absolutely necessary, our ability to hear, to respond to the voice of God, to the sound of God. Hearing from God is not a special status for ministers only. It is for every believer. It's for every believer. Some people just feel like, you know, that, oh, you know, uh, a certain so-and-so has a pipeline directly to heaven. No, 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 listen. No, 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 it's, it's for you. How, how do I know that? I, I, because I read it in my Bible. It's in your Bible too, John. St. John, Jesus said it. St. John chapter 10, verse 27. He says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. My sheep hear my voice. He didn't say my pastors. Jesus said, I'm the pastor. He said, I'm the good shepherd. And you are my sheep. He says, my sheep hear my, my voice. You have a capacity to be able to hear the voice of God. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons and daughters of God. They're the children of God. We're the children of God. You know why? Because we are his sheep and we hear his voice. So why would the God who loves you and gave his son for you not have anything to say to you? He has a plenty to say to you. You know why? Because communication is the basis of relationship. Communication is the basis of relationship. And the art of communication is not in our ability to hear or to speak, but it's in our ability to, to listen or hear. The art of communication is not in our ability to speak. It is in our ability to listen or hear. I love something that the theologian, the noted theologian Paul Tillich said. He said, the first duty of love is to listen. The first duty of love is to listen. You show that you love people by showing that you pay attention to what comes out of their mouth. And you know, if you talk to people and they don't pay attention to what you're saying, they're giving you a statement of how they value you or don't. Because the first duty of love is to listen. The first duty of love is to listen. It shows that you are valuable when somebody chooses to listen with you. 
And you listen with your eyes. You listen with your ears. You listen with your posture. You listen with your attentiveness and, and, and the active engagement of your mind. You listen with all of your whole being with a person. The first duty of love is to listen. And hearing from God begins with a desire to hear for God. That Lord speak to me. If you have something that you want to use anybody, use me God. Hearing from God begins with a desire to hear for God. And we're not trying to hear what we want to hear. We're trying to hear what God wants to say to us. We're not trying to hear what we want to hear. I want you to notice uh, St. John chapter 12 verse 49 in the New Living Translation. Jesus said, I don't speak on my own authority. The Father who sent me has commanded me what to say and how to say it. He says, I'm not even speaking on my own authority, my own accord. I'm speaking under the auspices of my Heavenly Father. I'm only speaking what He has commanded me to say, and even not only uh, what He's commanded me to say, but how He commands me to say it. And that's very important, uh, of what to say and how to say it. Have you ever sent a message by somebody? And they add their own interpretation, their flavor. You know, sometimes, you know, I mean, a, a parent will send another child and say, go and tell so-and-so to come here. And they said, daddy said, come here. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they are interpreting it with their tone. They delivered what was said, but they didn't do it how it was said. Jesus said, he's commanded me not only what to say, but also how to say it. Because if God is saying it to us in love, we can't go in anger and speak the word. He says, I want to teach you not only what to say, I want to teach you how to say it. Because people get offended not with, just with what you say, but how you say it. They get offended with our tone because somebody is short with them. It's like, well, what's up with them? I mean, it's like, I mean, I mean why do they do that? So it's not about the content. It's about your attitude, your tone. Tone offends a lot of people. Good morning. <laughs> I mean you walk in and you speak to some people good morning but good morning <laughs> and just their tone I mean they answered the content was right but how they said it was not right so Jesus said now, uh, I don't speak on my own authority I only speak what God commands me to say and how he gives it to me to say how, how to say it what to say and how to say it and remember what he said in Revelations chapter 2, verse 7. He says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Has an ear. He who has an ear, let him hear. You see, that, that communication is about hearing. It's about listening, hearing, so that we can respond. Now, I've taught you before that God speaks to us in about 10 primary ways. About 10 primary ways. Uh, the most primary way that I would say is that God speaks to us by His Word. The written Word, the Bible. God speaks to us by the Bible. That's, you, you, you need God to speak to you, uh, you know, you need a word from God, you've got 66 books of them. Uh, he speaks to us primarily by His Word. And anything else that God will say by any other mechanism needs to be in line with God's Word. I don't, don't have people sharing a vision or some dream that they had and it's out of line with the principle of the Bible. God primarily speaks to us by His Word. He speaks to us by angels. Angels are messengers who are sent with a message from God and God can send an angel for special annunciations of particular things from the heavens. God speaks to us thirdly by dreams. Dreams, He can give a dream uh, into your life and God speaks to you by a dream because sometimes our minds are too active for God to speak to us while we're awake and he has to sometimes speak to us in a dream he has to speak to us in a, in a dream and, and then there are other times that God speaks to us by visions by vision he gives us visions visions can oftentimes be experienced while you're wide awake I've had visions of the Lord while I was wide awake, he speaks to us by vision. God also speaks to us by prophets. He speaks to us by prophets. Number six, God speaks to us by gifts of the Spirit. You know, a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge. You know, uh, these, these, are, these are particular words that, uh, 
that can give us an understanding. The, the, the gift of prophecy, these are gifts of the Spirit that actually can reveal the mind of God. God can speak to us by the gifts of the Spirit. He also speaks to us spirit to spirit. God can speak to you spirit to spirit. You ever heard a person say, you know, the Lord spoke to my heart or God laid it on my heart? That's spirit to spirit. Spirit to spirit, where deep calls unto deep. He speaks to us spirit to spirit. Then God can also speak to us through godly counsel. God can speak to us through godly counsel. It can come from your mama. It can come from your daddy. It can come from somebody on your job. It can come from another Christian. And God can be speaking to them and say, baby, let me tell you this. I know you're thinking X, Y, Z. But let me tell you, baby, not everything that looks good is good. You'd be surprised. And godly counsel, I'm, te I'm just telling you. I mean, there are people that do stupid stuff and, and God was speaking to them through godly counsel and they totally ignored it. And then God can also speak to us through circumstances. Through circumstances. Sometimes God will close a door and he's speaking to us. Other times he'll open a door and he's speaking to us. Now, it has to be properly understood. I don't mean to just look at any sign. You know, it's like, you know, like, oh Lord, let the next man to come. Let, let that be my husband. <laughs> I'm not talking about setting up a fleece, you know, and you know, the who, let, Lord, who, whoever is supposed to be my spouse, Lord, let, them, let, them, let the phone ring. And, and, <laughs> you know, it may be a telemarketer. <laughs> it's probably a bill collector. <laughs> so uh, don't, don't get duped now by, by the circumstances, but there are particular things that God will be speaking to you. I mean, sometimes, you know, you, you're trying to sin and God will shut the door to that thing. And then you got to go out of your way. I mean, because you, you're trying to go out and fornicate and then you get in your car trying to start. It won't even start. Now you got to call Uber. <laughs> I mean, he was trying to stop you. And some people, some, there are some determined sinners. <laughs> you ought to touch your neighbor and say, I know this person. I know them. I know. <laughs> and then number 10, God can speak to you through an audible voice. Through an audible voice. You'd be surprised how God can speak to you through an audible voice. I remember I was driving in my car one day, and I heard the audible voice of the Lord say to me, I want you to teach my people how to know my will, for how can they do my will if they don't know it? And I turned to look to see whether somebody was in the back seat of the car. It was an audible voice of the Lord. It didn't speak in my head. It was outside of me. I heard it like another person in the automobile. It was the audible voice of the Lord that speaks much more authoritatively than the inward witness of God's voice speaking on the inside. So God wants to speak to your heart because your real ear is in your heart. Your real ear is in your heart. That's where your real ear is. And let me just say this to you that the greatest single indication that we are hearing from God and following His will is the presence of His peace in our heart. It's the greatest indication that you are hearing from God and following His will is the presence of His peace in our heart. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15 says, And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called, in one body and be thankful. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. In other words, peace should be the umpire of your soul. Because the umpire could say, that's out, that is out, that's out for you. That's out, it's the umpire. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Let it rule, let the peace rule. If you lose your peace, you better pull back. You better, you better pull back. If God gives you a peace, if, if he disturbs your peace about a decision that you're making, you better pull back. You better pull back if you lose your peace because the greatest single indicator that you're in the will of God is the presence of God's peace in your heart. Now you can be having a hard time and still have God's peace because God, it's God's way of saying, I'm still with you. I know you're having a hard time right now, but I'm still with you. And just remember this, feeling is the voice of the body. Feeling is the voice of the body. Feeling is the voice of the body. 
Reason is the voice of the mind. Reason. You know, when our mind speaks, we're reasoning. But cautious is the voice of the Spirit. Cautious is the voice of the Spirit. God begins to speak in your cautious. God begins to, he'll whip your cautious and let you know you shouldn't have done that. He will speak in your cautious and let you know that your tone with this person was disrespectful, it was rude, and you need to apologize. I mean, he, he will speak, and it's just, it's the it's voice of cautious. It's, 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 cautious is the voice of the spirit. Reason is the voice of the mind. Feeling is the voice of the body. You bump your toe, you scream. Feeling is the voice of the body. Reasoning is the voice of the, of the mind, but cautious is the voice of the spirit. So God speaks to us in, in, our, in our spirit, oftentimes through our cautious, being educated by the word of God. And listen, the more intimate that you are with God, the better that you are able to distinguish his sound from others. The more you're able to distinguish his sound from others. And this is why Jesus said, my sheep, hear my voice, and a stranger, uh, you know, they, they will not follow. My sheep know my voice. He says, my sheep know my voice. They know my voice. I told you when I was in Israel one time, I saw two shepherds passing in opposite direction, and they had their, their flock of sheep behind them. But when they got to a certain point, all of the sheep blended in. And I, and I was saying to myself, now this is interesting, because how is he going to know who his sheep are and how is this shepherd that's going the other way going to know which one he is? But the shepherd was making this noise, each one, and their sheep knew the noise, the sound of their shepherd. And they wouldn't follow the other one because they knew their shepherd's voice. They, they recognized, they were just doing, it was a special animal call, but they recognized the voice of their shepherd. You see, had I imitated that voice, they would have said, that's not my shepherd. Their ears were keen. They were discerning to know the voice of their shepherd and a stranger they would not follow. So you, when, you, when you know people intimately, you cannot be duped by the voice by an, an imposter. You know, um, you remember when Isaac got ready to bless uh, who he thought was Esau? You really, he really couldn't fool it because he put that hair on him. You remember uh, Esau was hairy, but Jacob was smooth. And so Jacob put the hair on him. And, and the daddy Isaac felt him. He said, it feels like Esau. He said, but it sounds like Jacob. And guess what he did? He made the same mistake that too many human beings make. He followed his feelings instead of the discerning of the voice. See, he heard the voice. He said, it is the voice of Jacob. But it feels, it feels like Esau. And he trusted his feeling over the discernment of the voice. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and a stranger they will not follow. You know, I have identical twins. And most people, if they hear their voices on the phone, they don't know which one is Kirsty and which one is Christy. But if I'm talking to them, I know them. I raised them from out of, out of the room. I caught them when they fell out of the room. I cut their umbilical cords. I, I, I recognize their, their, their cry. I, I, I know their voices. And it may take me a minute. <laughs> but I do know their voices. I do know their voices. And so they, 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 they couldn't trick me because I, I, I know their voices. When you know people, when you are acquainted with them, you, you learn to discern the voice. And so you ought to know what sounds like God. I don't care what so-called prophet or prophetess pops up. When you know your daddy's voice, there's certain things that you know, no, 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 no. My father has not spoken that at all. No, that's not like him. He wouldn't have said that to you. He didn't say that to you for me. I mean, did I remind you that three women told me that God said I was their husband? And I didn't marry now one of them. <laughs> it's interesting. So I'm, I'm t you know, we call that proper line. <laughs> Touch your neighbor and say, I know somebody like that. I know them. I know them. 
Now, why is it so important? Why is it so important to be able to discern the sound or the voice of the Lord in the earth? You know why? Because nothing happens in the kingdom of God until something is said. Nothing happens in the kingdom of God until something is said. Nothing happens in the kingdom of God until something is said. Amos chapter 3 verse 7, For the Lord God does nothing without revealing His secret to His servants, the prophets. God says, I'm not going to do anything on the earth until I speak it prophetically. I'm going, to, I'm going to reveal it, and I'm going to speak this thing. I'm not going to do anything. that, that There are going to be no surprises. God will already tell you, listen, I'm going to come. I'm going to judge y'all. Straighten up. Get your house right, because judgment is coming. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. He announced it. He will announce what he's going to do. And isn't it amazing that he still, it still surprises people? Because they don't recognize the voice. They're asleep. They sleep through the voice. And let me just say this, that hearing from God is not a once in a lifetime experience. There is a proceeding word from the Lord. In other words, you can't subside today, you know, continue to uh, exist today based on some word that God told you 10 years ago. You have to follow where you are now. Follow where you are now. What is God saying to you now? That's a, it's, a, it's an ongoing, it's a proceeding experience. You ever notice that in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3? He says, yes, he humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you with manna of food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. He did it to teach you that people do not live by bread alone. Rather, we live by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And then notice how Jesus talked about that. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 3 and 4, And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become uh, loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. That's a proceeding word. Every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. It means that there's something else that God has to say to you. He's not just one who'll just give you one word and never talk to you again. We have a relationship with him. When you have a relationship, you communicate. God will talk to you. So we live by what comes out of the mouth of God. Have you ever thought about the fact that had Abraham not been sensitive to listen to the preceding word of God, he would have killed his son? I mean, the word of the Lord told him, sacrifice your son, your only son, Isaac, up on Mount Moriah. Sacrifice your, your son. And he went up there with every intent. He went up there with the wood, with the, something to start the fire, and, and all of that, and his son. And his son. And, and he, was, he had strapped his son to the altar, ready to sacrifice his son. And as soon as he takes the dagger and draws it back, here now he gets the preceding word, Abraham, Abraham. And he stops mid-stroke. See, he had to, God knew that he could trust Abraham after that to instantly obey him. Because he, he didn't have time there to go with the whole conversation. He just had to stop him mid-stroke to say, you know, I told you that, but now here's the word now. And there's a preceding word. Because God can lead you to a place, and you can be arguing with God and say, God, you, you, you led me here. But he can lead you away from it. Because that season might have passed. And when that does, you've got to get the preceding word. If you overstay your time, things are not, they're not going to go well. That's why it's so important to hear the preceding word of God. The preceding word of God. Preceding word of God. Because we live by the words that proceed, that continue to come out of God's mouth. We've got to be ready to instantly respond to whatever God says to us. Remember, God's voice brings certain things to us. God's voice brings conviction. Whenever God speaks to His voice brings conviction. He convicts us, which inspires us to get right. It's not to condemn you and make you feel terrible about yourself. The purpose of conviction is to motivate you to get right. So God's voice brings conviction. God can speak to you about something, and immediately your spirit is convicted. It's convicted. But then again, you can be upset, and then when you hear the voice of God, it brings comfort. God's voice just speaking to you says, be not afraid, for I'm with you. God, he'll speak to you sometime and just let you know, it's going to be okay. Everything is going to work out. I've got this. Trust me. 
I've got this. And, and those words bring comfort to you. Other times, his, his word brings confirmation. You know, God will have spoken something to you, and then he speaks another word through someone else, and you realize this is confirmation. Confirmation, confirmation. You know, the Lord will be dealing with you in your spirit about something. Say, you know what? It's time for you to go on a fast. It's time for you to go on a fast. And you'll be trying to rebuke the devil, you know. <laughs> and then you'll come, and then somebody will bring up fasting, and you realize this is not a coincidence. This is a confirmation because the voice of the Lord will confirm what he's saying to you. He will confirm his word. The voice of the Lord will confirm the written word. And so if God has spoken into your spirit, he will. And if you're not sure about it, God will bring confirmation. And, and a fourth thing that his word brings, his voice brings, it is clarity, clarity. Sometimes you don't know exactly, you know, he, he will have told you a general type of thing. And then God's word being brought to you will bring clarity, clarity to your life, clarity. He brings a greater understanding to something else that he's previously spoken to us. Greater depth, greater clarity. And then the voice of the Lord also brings compass-like direction. He brings compass-like direction. He shows us the way to go. He'll say, this is the way, walk ye in it. His voice brings compass-like direction. So I, I want to encourage you, practice hearing the Word of God. You have to practice hearing God's sound through various things. And I, I just want to give you three things here that you practice hearing God's voice through because we've got to be able to respond to his sound so practice hearing God's sound through first minutes first minutes now uh, what, what do I mean by first minutes what I'm, when I say first minute I mean talk to God for the first minute that you get out of bed the first minute that you wake up talk to God talk to God the first minute that you're in the shower talk to God the first minute while you're in your car talk to God Lord, you know, I'm getting in this car. And you know these folks are crazy out here on these streets. You get on the train, Lord, you know all of the Looney Tunes are out. The first, first, first minute that you're there, first minutes, first minutes, learn to hear God during the first minute. Talk to God. Talk to God. The first minute that you're at work, talk to God. And you walk in there, Lord, now you're going to have to give me strength for these folks that I'm going to have to deal with today. I, I need you. The fir first minute, learn to, to practice the presence of God, hearing the voice of God by giving God your attention the first minute of every new activity. The major sh shifts that you do. You, your eyes pop up in the morning. Talk to God. First minute. You get in the shower. Talk to God. You, you, you got to be doing something. You're skilled enough. You know where everything is and how to wash it. Just go ahead and talk. Go ahead and talk to him. You see? Talk to him. Get in the car, talk to him. Get on the train, talk to him. Get at work, talk to him. First minute, just the first minute. First minutes, talk to God. Practice hearing God's sound through first minutes. Number two, through second thoughts. Second thoughts. And uh, this is when you're getting ready to do something and all of a sudden you have a second thought. This, this then becomes that voice that says, something told me. You, you have a... You have a <laughs> You ever in, in the, in the, you know how hindsight is twenty twenty. You ever been, and we, we weren't fully sure that at, at the moment that, that we were hearing that voice, we, we were second guessing, we had a second thought. Pay attention to the second thoughts. Because we all, we, we think that, yeah, this is the common sense thing to do, and all of a sudden you have a second thought. Maybe you shouldn't get involved with, with him. Maybe you shouldn't be involved with her. Maybe this is not the opportunity for you to take. Don't move into this neighborhood. And you have a second thought about it. I mean, everything sometimes on paper, it looks like this is the reasonable choice. And, and then all of a sudden you have a second thought. And that second thought was said, no, no, don't do this. Don't do this. I was invited to another country and I had, I had accepted and said that I was going. And all of a sudden I had a second thought. The second thought said, no, 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 no. And my friend from Phoenix, he went. And I know his wife and his two daughters. And he went. And I would have been in the car with him and he was killed on the trip. I had a second thought. I said, I'm not going. I'm, I canceled the trip. Now, I don't know whether he just, he, he, he loved God. He loved God. He knew God. But I had a second thought. And I canceled my trip from the second thought. A truck crossed over into that lane. 
Killed him instantly, head on. I would have been in the car with him. But I had a second thought. This was my second thought. I said, don't, don't do that. Don't, don't do that. Sometimes I just have a second thought. I, I'm going to get on a plane. I was invited to another country. I told them I was going. You know, I had a second thought. This was a council of the ticket over in Asia. And I said, no, 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 I'm not going. Guess what? The bishop didn't go. I, 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 I didn't get a scripture. I didn't hear an audible voice. I had a second thought. I obeyed that second thought. I obeyed it. I obeyed the second thought. And do you know what happened? Three Christian pastors there were beheaded. Beheaded. I said, I need my head. And you know, I, I just had a second thought. I'm, t I'm just, I'm, you know, listen, I'm telling, this is why I'm telling you about responding to God's sound, to his voice, because I had a second thought that blessed my life. Oh, my God. I, it saved my life. It saved, I'm just telling you, second thoughts, second thoughts. So don't do that. Don't, don't go. Don't get on this. You will be, don't eat that. You get ready to order this, this, this stew on the menu. You have a second thought, you'll be up all night. <laughs> and then number three is third dimensions. Third dimensions. See, the first dimension is length. We see how far we can go in our own strength and our flesh. The second dimension is width. We see how wide we can reach. But the third dimension is depth. We see how deep we can go. Let me say this to you. Read your Bible for depth, not distance. Don't just see how many chapters you can read. See how many verses you can get with understanding. Don't try to go far, go deep. It's, Paul said, I'd rather be able to speak five words in a language I can understand. I'd rather have a little with understanding than a whole lot, and I don't even understand this thing. Go for depth. Third dimension is the depth. That's where the depth is. Isaiah chapter 28, verse 10, it says, For it is precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. That's about depth. That's about depth. Just, just get the little bit and say, God, what does this mean? Help me to understand what this means. I need to unpack this. So I'm just telling you, you'll be surprised. There is sometimes the strength of God that will come in one verse of Scripture. Not a chapter, a verse. A verse of Scripture that becomes depth to you because you were sick and God gave you a verse. You were in a struggle. You were in trouble and God gave you a verse and said, you know what? You're with this, but I'm with you. Fear thou not. Neither be thou dismayed. God will just give you a verse. And you get that. It's such a depth of understanding in just that verse. God will give you a verse about trusting him. You won't know what to do. But somehow there's a strength that comes through that, that third dimension of depth. That it's, 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 the, it's, it's third dimensions. It's, it's the dimension of having a depth of understanding that God, I hear you now. Now I understand what my grandmama was talking about because you got to live a little bit sometimes to understand the depth of what somebody means when they begin to thank God and when they begin to cry out to God for God to lead them and to guide them and to deliver them and to keep them safe from hurt, harm, and danger. I, I mean, that there's a depth of understanding just in, in, in a little scripture. So first minutes, first minute, every new activity, first minute, talk to God, talk to God, talk to God. Pay attention to second thoughts, second thoughts, because God will try to warn you. He will, he will raise red flags in your spirits and give you a caution. Don't get involved with this person. Don't get involved with this person. I know they look good, they sound good, and everything seems like it's right, but God, you know, you have some, second thought. Said, so don't fool with that. Don't fool with that. And then third dimensions, go for depth. Just drop your hook. And let it go down deep. And let me tell you this, because little fish hang out at the surface of the water. But the big fish, the barracudas, the, you, got, you got to drop your line and go deep. Big fish don't hang out on the surface. They're, they're bottom dwellers. The big fish, meaty fish, the fish, that white flaky fish that <laughs> melts in your mouth. You got to go deep for that. You can't get any meat off of a tadpole. 
You want the big fish, you got to go deep third dimensions. You got to go deep. Jesus will take you into the depths of the spirit. He'll let you, he'll say, come, come on in the water. He'll say, come, 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 come further. Get away from the edge. Launch out into the, into the deep. Launch out into the deep. Because that's where you'll catch the drought, the, the multitude of what God really wants to give you. is out in the deep. First thoughts, first, first minutes, first minutes, second thoughts, third dimensions. Recognize the sound. During the time of the Great De Depression, 19, the, the Great Depression of 1929, jobs were so scarce. You'd have one job and hundreds of people would show up to get one job. And here the military had a job that was available and sure enough, hundreds of people showed up for the job. And uh, all of them were standing in line and one man heard something and he broke out of the line and he went to the front and everybody else was looking at him. They were hiring somebody who could read and understand Morse code. So they sent the message out over a loudspeaker in Morse code. They were tapping the message. If you can understand this message, break out of the line, come to the front, the job is yours. And one man could hear and understand the tapping. Others didn't know what this unsyncopated rhythm was of a tap, 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 tap. They, they had no clue as to what it was saying. But to another man, they were not sporadic taps. It was a message saying that if you can understand this message, break out of the line, come to the front, the job is yours. And one man heard it with an understanding and God sometimes is looking for somebody who can hear the voice of God. The Bible says Noah found grace in the eyes of God. Grace was there for everybody, but Noah was the only one who found it. It's the only one who was able to hear God says, I want you to build me something because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to judge the earth and I'm going to cleanse it and I need you to build an ark. He's looking for somebody that he can talk to to give you the revelation of his plan. God says, I know the plans that I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. God says, I know the plan, but I want to talk to you about them. And I'm looking for somebody who's got an ear to be able to hear and understand the voice of the shepherd. My sheep hear my voice and a stranger they will not follow. That where you, where you know him, he will speak to his sheep. He'll speak to his sheep. We're his sheep. His voice is one of the most precious things that you could ever get. I'd rather that people take possessions, physical possession, but don't take the wonderful possession of the voice of the Lord from my life. I'd be lost without his voice. It is my guiding light. I follow his voice. I follow his voice. And when you cannot trace his hand, follow his voice. I pray you got something out of the word of the Lord. We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you wanna partner with us, Click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.